Hello. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with today's grand rounds. Um, today we have a guest speaker, um, and what I'm going to do is slightly a little different from uh, what was expected. I'll introduce Brian Jones, who will then introduce Dr. McCall. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, not sure how this usually works, uh, but uh, Dr. McCall is actually going to give two lectures today, as usual for a basic science person, um, so I'd encourage you also to attend the noon lecture, um, where you'll get uh, a different story. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's my distinct pleasure, uh, actually, to introduce my friend Maureen, uh, Dr. McCall, and uh, we've known each other for a while. Um, uh, Maureen, uh, Dr. McCall got her uh, bachelor's in psychology at the University of Maryland uh, and then did something very cool, uh, got a master's degree in psychophysics. Uh, and psychophysics is not taught really much anymore, uh, which, which is a tragedy, especially given all of the uh, clinical therapeutics that are going in, in, into play. Uh, it's actually one of the great shortcomings. Um, I'll leave that editorial there. Um, and then uh, she got her PhD uh, in neurobiology at, uh, at Albany uh, in New York, uh, did a postdoc in Wisconsin, uh, and then uh, started shortly thereafter, a little, little while uh, after at University of Louisville, where she's been for um, a number of years now. So um, Dr. McCall, thank you. So thank you for inviting me, um, and uh, in particular because it's snowing in Louisville and the university's closed. And also thank you for um, having uh, grand rounds at 8 a.m. instead of at 7.30 the way we do in Louisville. <clears throat> um, and, and lastly, um, you know, I, I, I talk fast and I get going, and so sometimes I don't see a hand raised, so please feel free to say, hey, slow down and explain something to me uh, as I go through my, my, my uh, seminar this morning. Um, so my lab has two arms to it, and this morning I'm going to talk to you about the work that we do that's more translational and related to uh, retinal photoreceptor degeneration. Um, and, 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 and so just to give you an idea of where we're going to go with, where I'll go with this lecture is, I'm going to briefly touch on the retinal circuit and then the changes that occur in retinitis pigmentosa. And so most of you probably are more of an expert in this than I am. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the genetic nature of retinitis pigmentosa because all of this leads into why, uh, why this is a, a disease that can be addressed in terms of potential therapies with gene therapy, which is where I will end up. Uh, and then in, and in between, I'm going to tell you about uh, the creation uh, and characterization of a, of a pig model of RP, uh, because uh, the pig is a, a very good model for uh, the human disease. And then finally, I'll tell you a, a little bit about some of uh, the data that's coming out of our uh, gene therapy approaches in, in this model. So this is just a schematic of, of a retinal uh, circuit. And from an electrophysiologist's point of view, the photoreceptors are on the top. And I know that anatomical views usually put the photoreceptors down here. And so I'm just going to tell you that most of the time in my slides, you'll see photoreceptors on the top and the ganglion cells on the bottom. But occasionally, when we are collaborating with our, our, our uh, anatomists, the slide will be flipped upside down, and I'll try to remind you that that's the case. Okay, so we all know that the way this works is light comes in through the, ret through the transparent retina, and then uh, that light energy is transduced into a, into a signal within the photoreceptors, and then that re results in a change in glutamate release from the photoreceptors, which then leads to a, a vertical uh, information flow through the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells and out from the ganglion cells to the rest of the, of the uh, visual system. So in, in, in retinitis pigmentosa, 
because of mutations that occur in proteins in the rod photoreceptors, you get the first part of the first step in the sequence of neurodegeneration is that the rod photoreceptors die. And they die over a certain length of time. And then it, because of reasons that we don't understand, um, but are active areas of investigation, the cones can't be sustained in their normal morphological and functional, uh, 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 normally in, uh, no, normal morphology and function. And what we end up with at end stage disease are uh, cone photoreceptor somas that don't have their outer segments or their pedicles. So these structures have, have retracted, but even late in, in, in disease in both, the, in both the pig model that I'll talk about and the rodent models that we know about and in humans, there are these cone pho photoreceptor nuclei that remain. And so this is exciting from the point of view that if those cells are still there, there's the po potential that they can be rescued and remake their connections. But in this, in this stage, when the, the cones now have retracted and no longer make connections with the second order neurons, we get blindness. And, and so um, in, in the end stage disease in humans, they are legally blind and don't have any, um, any real uh, uh, light perception at all. So this occurs in a lot of patients um, and in, uh, as an autosomal dominant disease. 20 to 30 percent of the, of the patients that you see will have an autosomal uh, dominant mutation. That means that they only need one mutant copy. And, that, and then they get the disease manifestation. And out of those 20 to 30 percent, eight and a half percent of these autosomal dominant RP arise from mutations in the rhodopsin gene, which is shown here. And the rhodopsin gene is this transmembrane protein. Here's the extracellular side, and here's the cytoplasmic side. And, you can, and there are mutations in a bunch of different places. The one that I'm going to focus on today is a proline to histidine mutation here at position 23. But there's another, uh, there's several other models. There's a, uh, there's a model out here that uh, has a mutation at, at uh, position 347. Um, and then there are a bunch of others in between. Um, so what happens is that because this protein is mutated, it doesn't traffic properly and it, to the outer segments of the, of the photoreceptors, and it becomes toxic, and the photoreceptors die as a consequence of this. So it's a little bit like the neurofibrillary tangles that you hear about in Alzheimer's, and they gum up the works, and because of that, the cell goes into, into stress, and the cell dies. In RP, uh, most of the, it's, a, it's a progressive disease, and as you all know, we're our, our, our visual system's really good at fooling us. Um, you don't see patients in a lot of cases until they're very well progressed into either RP or glaucoma, any of these things, because our visual system fills in uh, and, and, and is redundant in some, in some respects. And so these patients really don't come in until they experience night blindness, is usually the first complaint when they're seen in the clinic. So once the patients have come in, they've lost a lot of their rod photoreceptors already, and so we don't know what the early sequences are in these patients. Um, it, it, it might become more obvious now that, we ha have, with, that we're better at diagnosing, because these are autosomal dominant, and so that we can do genetic testing. And then we could track children as they start to progress into the disease, but that hasn't become one of the things that's, uh, that's, that's currently uh, done a lot. And so what we've done is to turn to animal models to try to study the early steps in the, in the sequence and, and, then, and, and in these models to try to intervene early, mid, and late in the disease to see what our, what our therapies can do. So the classes of animal models, there, there are two. Uh, one are spontaneous mutants, and these are uh, animals that are found usually by mistake. Um, we found a, 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 a mouse model for congenital stationary night blindness because one of our collaborators was using mice from a particular colony and the control animals didn't have a, a, an ERGB wave. And so all of a sudden that opened up a whole uh, set of, of, of ways of looking at congenital stationary night blindness. 
Um, other mo mouse models are, that are common for RP are RD1 and RD10. And again, these have mutations that are part of not the rhodopsin gene itself, but part of the phototransduction cascade. Um, there's a, a, a rat model with a, 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 the Royal College of Surgeons rats that, that's a mutation in the RPE. <clears throat> and the RPE is important because it phagocytizes the outer segments. And if you don't phagocytize the outer segments, then that becomes toxic to the photoreceptors themselves, and then they die again from a slightly different point of view. And then there are several inbred dog models, and these arise because of, because of the inbreeding in, in particular uh, strains of, of dogs. And so then the puppies come up blind, and then those puppies are usually donated to uh, a facility at the University of Pennsylvania where they study them. And then more recently, we've been able to molecularly manipulate the genome of mice, <clears throat> and a little bit in the rat, and then a little bit in the bunny, and most recently in the pig. And so what we can do is we can create either one of two kinds of molecularly manipulated animals. We can create transgenic animals, and they mimic the human defect because they, they can carry, actually, you can actually make them carry the human uh, a mutant gene, but they don't um, mimic the gene complement. So in a, in a retinitis pigmentosa patient, as I said, if it's autosomal dominant, you'll have one copy that's a mutant copy and one copy that's a wild type copy. In the transgenic animals, you get two normal copies and then the transgene that's, that's inserted into the genome uh, as an extra protein. Uh, and, ex and examples of this, are the P23H rhodopsin mutant mouse, that's not spelled right, uh, rat, and then the pig that I'll tell you about today. There is another mutation in rhodopsin at, the, at 334. This is a serine to a, to a termination stop codon, and this is a rat model. And then the original pig model that was, that was uh, made in, 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 in uh, Rob Petter's lab was a proline to leucine at, at, at rhodopsin 347. This was a full-size pig. The pigs I'll tell you about today are mini pigs. So now, more recently, we've been able to knock in the mutant gene. So you replace the one copy of the wild-type gene with the mutant gene, and part of this, uh, the ability to do this is because of the work of Mario Capecchi, who I, you probably all know. Uh, as well as uh, Oliver Smithies, who, who died just recently. Um, and in here, this, now you can get the human defect because you can knock in the human, uh, the human mutant gene and, and, you knock out, and, and, and you knock out one copy of the, of the wild type gene at the same time. So now you have the human defect that, that is mimicked and the gene complement that's mimicked. We have not been able to make a knock-in pig yet, um, but, but, the, but there's a recent, uh, recently developed P23H knock-in mouse that's been very useful, uh, made by uh, uh, Chris Polchewski as well as by Ted, Ted Wenzel. So these are the animal models that we have available to us, and, like a, and as I said, I'm going to tell you a lot of today about this P23H rhodopsin mutant pig that we developed. And we did this in collaboration with the National Swine Research Resource Center uh, that's located at the University of Missouri. And they are the, they, they are the, the cutting edge of, of making transgenic and knock-in uh, pig models. And so they have been successful in making <laughs> knock-in pig models, but not for RP yet. This is one of the goals that we are work, continuing to work with them on. And Randy Prather is the, is the lead uh, at the National Swine Research Center. And we work with both Eric Walters and, and, and Jason Ross to create founders uh, of the P23H uh, mutant pigs. So this is a mini pig. Uh, and the reason that the pig is such a good model is that its eye size is similar. Its developmental program is similar to humans. <clears throat> it's it has a visual streak, so here's the fundus image of one of our, our transgenic pigs. Here's the optic nerve head. The blood vessel pattern is somewhat similar to, hu to humans. We have a, a, a blood vessel-free, uh, what, what is called the visual streak. 
It's not a fovea, it's not a macula, but it's the next best thing given that the only other organisms that have a fovea and macula are non-human primates, some non-human primates, um, and, and human primates. So uh, we, they used somatic uh, cell nuclear transfer to do this, and then what we did was to create and characterize six different founder animals. Um, and the important thing is that they carry this human P23H rhodopsin mutation. And so any therapy that we find that is efficacious and safe uh, can then be easily translated to the clinic because it's the same mutation that, that you will be treating in, in, the, in the human patients. So a lot of what we do um, in terms of the electrophysiological assessment relies on the ERG. And I know all of you are familiar with the ERG. Here's one of our uh, more uh, mature uh, pigs <coughs> with a jet electrode on his, um, on his cornea. This is the LKC Gonsfeld, and we, we literally shove his place gently, his head into the, the, the Gonsfeld. And what you know is that the ERG is a gross potential, and so it, it, it reflects all of the processing of the retina, both peripheral and central, and that's going to be important. Uh, in terms of some of the uh, in some of the challenges that we face uh, in gene therapy, so uh, the A wave, as you are all probably familiar, is the is the, the the change in the polarization of the photoreceptors after a flash of light. Uh, it's a down and, and it's just a and and it's followed by the B wave, which is the post uh, receptoral uh, component, mo primarily from the depolarizing bipolar cells, and if you see these little tiny wiggles on here, those are called oscillatory potentials, and they reflect a lot of the circuitry here in the inner, in the inner plexiform layer. So we can uh, assess photoreceptor function and bipolar cell function, and you can, and, if there, and as I said, if you have congenital stationary night blindness, you'll see a normal uh, uh, amplitude A wave, but no B wave. In RP, what happens is that the A wave decreases and the B wave also decreases because it's dependent on the polarization of the, of the photoreceptors. Um, and you, we can change the lighting conditions so we can dark adapt the animal and, and use very dim flashes to assess uh, rod photoreceptor function or we can put an adapting background which saturates the rod response and then pre and present uh, bright light, uh, light flashes and assess cone function. So we can get both rod and cone function separately uh, in using the ERG. And the other thing, of course, you know is that the ERG is a non-invasive gross potential. And so we can use this on a weekly or monthly basis to track what's happening in terms of the degeneration process or in terms of functional recovery uh, after therapy. So I'm going to take you through uh, the, the, the characterization of the, of the six founder pigs that we, that we did uh, to figure out who to use uh, to, for, for the rest of our experiments. And what we found uh, electrophysiologically is that if we looked at the scotopic B wave and we started at three months, uh, we found two different classes of founders. We found the ones that were severely affected and had no rod function at, from three months all the way through eight, uh, 18 to 24 months. There were some that were moderately affected, so they had rod function at three months, and then that declined. Um, and then in terms of their cone function, uh, the, the severely affected had uh, some change in the, in the cone uh, B wave uh, at, at, even at three months, and then that is pretty solid uh, maintained all the way out to 18 to 24 months. So this is very similar uh, in, in terms of the, the, um, uh, the human function, except that the humans have rod function. So they're more similar to the moderately affected. But when we were trying to figure out which animal to use as our founder for the rest of our experiments, we had one other factor that we needed to take into account, and that is the size of the animal. So these are mini pigs, but mini pigs are still pigs. And so once you get out to about uh, you know, 22 months, 
these are substantial animals. They weigh in at about four, five hundred pounds. And so we decided that from the point of view of animal husbandry, uh, that, that a severely affected animal would, should give us a phenotype that we could work with in a time frame where the pigs only got to be about 150 or 200 pounds at termination. And so a lot of this electrophysiological work was done by Juan Fernandez de Castro, uh, who was a postdoc in the lab and has now gone into private practice in, in Florida. So here uh, is some, are some beautiful histological preparations from Brian Jones, who helped us with looking at these founders. Uh, this is an adult uh, domestic pig. So here are the photoreceptors out here in the outer nuclear layer and, the, and, and their um, uh, outer segments. Uh, and, and the rest of the lamination pattern is, is beautiful and normal uh, in this adult. Um, in the two moderately affected animals uh, at, at 18 and 22 months, uh, you can see that there's still some of uh, 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 photoreceptors that are around. These are primarily cones. Uh, and, and here's our, one of our severely affected animals at 12 months. And you can see that all they have left are these cone uh, photoreceptor nuclei, and then the inner uh, nuclear layer, and then the ganglion cell layer. So, uh, th but this is, so when, when we first started with these guys, they wouldn't let us work with them before they were, before three months of age. And so we didn't know whether they had any rod function at birth. And so that was something that we, needed to do in terms of once we got the F1 uh, or the offspring from whichever founder we, we selected. So we selected this one called 53-1. And as I said, we knew that he had no, uh, no, no rod function at three months of age. But we knew that his cone function was similar to wild type. And we knew that there was a slow and progressive decline of cone function. So because of these limitations in terms of husbandry, we selected him as the founder. And so then we wanted to know, uh, for it, in terms of what the model could do for us, whether the, this, this founder transmitted the transgene in Mendelian fashion, so at, as an autosomal dominant mutation, whether the F1s had the same phenotype as the founder. And then we wanted to be able to use these guys so that we could look and see whether rods were present at birth and whether they functioned and then declined. And then we wanted to know whether the cones developed normally during those first three months before the, the, they declined. And so I'll go through those data now. So here are the morphological data first. And so here are the wild type animals on the left and the P23H transgenic pigs on the, on the right. This is at E105. So you can see that they have a full complement of photoreceptors right prior to birth. The um, gestation time in, in a pig is about 113 days. And if you count the number of, of, of photoreceptor nuclei, you can see that they're identical. Um, at P0, there is a, a small uh, change in the, uh, in the uh, outer nuclear layer that's shown here in this summary. Um, and uh, here's P0. Uh, and in P3, there's a, there's a further, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is P3. Uh, there's a further decline. And then as you go past uh, P, between P14 and P1660, there's a real decline in rod photoreceptors. That at P90 and all the way out at P120, you see that there's a single layer of nuclei, and, the, and they have the morphological uh, appearance of of cone nuclei, and, and, they, and we have, and I'll show you, we have cone function uh, out at P120. And the, these data were generated by Wei Wong and Patrick Scott in our department. There's a central to peripheral decline in rod photoreceptors uh, that's shown here, uh, summarized on this slide in these butterfly plots. So we go from P0 to P3, all the way to P120. And this, uh, this image of, uh, that's a schematic of the, of the fundus shows where the most effect is, which is here in temporal ventral retina. So uh, if, if you take a look uh, at, at what's, what's plotted here is that there's more of a decline in temporal retina uh, early, here and here. Temporal retina is lower than, than nasal retina. And then 
um, the uh, ventral retina is more affected than the dorsal retina until you get out to a P, about P120, which is why this dark shading is here in this area. In terms of the, in terms of the ultra structure, uh, you, these are much higher power images than I've been showing you before. And you can see that at P0, the cones have a uh, very nice uh, structure. They have inner segments and outer segments. And there are even some uh, rod photoreceptors that have inner and outer segments uh, sprinkled in here. Um, at even higher power, it, at P0, you can see ribbon synapses in both the wild type and the P23H. And you can see that the cone pedicles are normal in both of these animals at P3. And as we go through from P14 to P60, the cone outer segments retract and so do their pedicles. So at greater than P90, the cone pedicles have retracted as well. And even though they are re they've retracted, we still have some signaling through the cones in the retina, and I'll show you that right now. So over here are representative traces of ERGs, uh, uh, ERG responses uh, at P3. In gray is the wild type, and in black is, are the transgenic offspring. So we have these animals born at the University of Louisville, and so we can begin to, uh, to assess them as early as P3. We find that after, before P3, uh, it's a little difficult to anesthetize them and then bring them back. Uh, but, they're, but they're pretty hardy by P3. Um, and at P60, the, this is, so at the top here is the rod response. We, so as, as I showed you in the, in the founder animal, there's, there's no fun, rod function here, but unfortunately we have no rod function, even though we have a full complement of rods, uh, nuclei at this point. But, but at P3 and all the way close to P60, uh, the cone function is, is pretty good and, and pretty robust. And, the, and the, um, the summary data is shown here on the right. So this is the scotopic or the rod-driven responses. We don't see any in the, in the offspring of, of 53.1, just like in 53.1, which is plotted here in the triangles. Uh, whereas the wild type uh, pig has a, a, is, has a normal development of rod function and then that plateaus uh, after about P60. In terms of the photopic response, P3 and P14 and P30 are, are almost exactly the same between the wild type and the transgenic. So this is nice because the cone system seems to develop normally. And in many of the very aggressive forms in the rodents, the, the, the degeneration of rods and cones uh, occurs at the same time as the normal development. And so you have these issues of, are you looking at a change in developmental sequence or are you looking at a change in photoreceptor uh, degeneration? Uh, and, and so we, in terms of our cone system, we can say that the cones develop normally. And a lot of this ERG data was done by a, a, a graduate student in my lab who's finished and her, whose name is Jennifer Knoll. So to summarize, what we know about the offspring is that they have no evidence of rod function from birth onward. But their cone function is normal, and then it declines. So in terms of cone function, they're very similar <coughs> to what happens in the human patients. In terms of rod function, they are, they are not as good a model. So, and the other thing is that they all, they, uh, what I didn't tell you is that they inherit in a Mendelian fashion. So about 50% of the animals that are born in every one litter are transgenic or, and or wild type. And so they all have the same phenotype as the founder. So they're, in, in terms of the genetics, they're a good model for, uh, for RP. So this slide shows what happens in terms of the rhodopsin expression. And now the, the transgenic is over here on, uh, on the left and the wild type is here on the right. And this is a, a, a nissel stain to remind me to tell you that this is from our, one of our uh, anatomical studies and so it's upside down. So the photoreceptor uh, inner and outer segments are, are shown here uh, with, and, and then in the transgenic, the rhodopsin is actually expressed all the way through the cell bodies and, uh, and into their terminals. Um, and so this mislocalization is probably part of the reason why these rod photoreceptors are dying. 
In terms of the expression pattern, uh, the wild type now is shown up here between P30 and P120, and we can see rhodopsin expression uh, in the transgenic at P30 and just a smattering at P60. So even out to P60, there's some rhodopsin that's still being expressed. And so the hope is that if we can do something in terms of uh, eliminating the mutant protein that we might be able to rescue some function, and I'll show you some data about that later in the talk. Okay, <coughs> so let me stop here for a moment and summarize. So what we see in, the, in this P23H transgenic pig model is, is the way we interpret this as three stages of retinal uh, degeneration in terms of retinal structure and function. The first stage is, is, the, is, the, is a loss of rod-driven function, okay? That's, that's happening here, P0 to P14. And then we have a mid-stage, P30 to P60, where, the, 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 where we've lost the rod function completely and the cone function starts to decline. And then we have this idea of end-stage disease, which is lar longer than P90. And so, Depending on the stage, the, 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 the therapy is going to have to be tailored to the stage of disease. And, um, and I'll, I'll talk about those therapies in a second. Uh, but what I want to do is also tell you one other way that we assess visual function in these animals. So as I said, we, when we use the ERG, it's got the advantage that we can use it successively over time, and we can actually assess weekly if we want to. But as I showed you in that earlier slide, it gives you the, the, a view of what the entire retina is doing. And I also showed you that the cone function has a central to peripheral gradient. And so at any one point in time, with the ERG, we are looking at how good the peripheral retina is, whereas the central retina has probably lost function. But what we'd really like to know is what happens in particular locations in the retina. And so you can use the multifocal ERG, but I'm not a big fan of it. Um, but what my lab also can do is actually take portions of the retina and place them on a multi-electrode array and put them into a dish and then use visual stimulation to activate the retina in vitro. And we can record from the retinal ganglion cells and ask questions about visual processing using different light flashes or do, using different kinds of visual stimuli. And we can do this either here in the central retina or we can, we can, take a, we can dissect a piece of retina out from peripheral retina, and, and if we, this is where we place our treatment, then we can ask whether treatment has affected this very particular localization in the retina versus in an intra-eye control or in the control uh, fellow eye, which, may not be, which we may, may not have treated. And what we end up doing is recording the action potentials of these ganglion cells on these electrodes and the nice part of this approach is that we have 60 electrodes. We can usually get about 90 different ganglion cells on, our, on each recording. And so therefore, we get a nice uh, survey of what the ganglion cells are doing in a particular area uh, versus in another area. And so we did that with these P23H animals. And here's the, here's a, here are schematic, uh, not schematic, uh, these are what we call uh, post-stimulus time, peristimulus time histograms. And at the top, each of these little ticks is an action potential. And so then we can look at the average over many trials. We usually do 10 to 20 trials and we use different brightnesses of, of light stimuli. And what you can see is that you get this nice peak firing and then sometimes a maintained firing for the two seconds that the light is on. And that sustained component usually increases with uh, the brightness of the light. And sometimes we see a decline in the peak, but this has to do with light adaptation. When we use the same visual stimuli in transgenic animals, when, when we're in rod isolated conditions, we see no response. So the rods are not driving the ganglion cells at this low level. But you can see that once the, 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 we reach cone uh, function, 
that you can see these beautiful responses uh, among the remaining cones. And so here's the summary of this kind of an experiment where we're plotting the light intensity uh, on, this, on the uh, x-axis versus the percent of visually responsive ganglion cells. Wild type, again, is in gray and transgenic is in black. So you can see at, under rod only conditions, we have no ganglion, cell, ganglion cells being driven in the transgenic animal. But as soon as we get up to some place where the cones can become sensitive, we start to pick up on the visual responses, and the cones then saturate in 100% of the cells that the cones that are there have, have, you know, have really good responses. And this is out at P120. So this plots the percent of visually responsive cells as a function of age, and that's stable in the wild type animal, but in the transgenic animal you can see that, uh, that there's a decline in, in cone function uh, all the way out to P90. But the cones that remain have very good and robust responses. So um, we, we're losing drive to the cones, but the cones that have responses are being maintained in a, in, a, in a very stable fashion. And this actually also is similar to what happens in, in humans until they start to lose cone function. All right, so this takes us back to that schematic that I showed you earlier uh, about the three stages of, of transgenic photoreceptor degeneration. When we're here, the question that we want to address is, can we restore rod function and prevent cone degeneration by getting rid of the, the mutant uh, rhodopsin. And then in the mid-stage, the question is, can we prevent further cone dysfunction? So can we do something to support the cones in some way, shape, or form so that they, they are arrested at the, from the time of treatment onward? And then in end-stage disease, there are a lot of treatments that other people are trying and I'm not going to talk about this, but they include prosthetic devices that will drive the circuit, uh, optogenetics that will replace the, the drive of the photoreceptors, and stem cell therapies and, and, other, and other transplantation strategies. So what I'd like to do now is just to talk about what, what these two, what, what you might want to do with gene therapy um, uh, in, in these two stages of the disease. So as I said, what we'd like to know uh, is whether we can restore rod function by manipulating, and in our case, the P23H rhodopsin gene expression. And then here we want to know whether we can dis delay cone dysfunction and degeneration. And the idea here is to in, in our hands is to provide some kind of trophic support or some neuroprotection strategy. So just for uh, everybody in the audience to, who might not know about gene therapy, um, this is a, a brief summary of how we deliver the virus and how the, to, the, the viral delivery of the genes and, and the protein <coughs> expression. So we use adeno-associated virus um, because it's usually well tolerated. Uh, and we use these and we, and we, we pull, pull out the guts of the, of the viral genome and replace it with whatever genes we want to use in terms of our, in terms of our functional uh, strategies. So we can manipulate the AAV vector coat, and this is what some of my uh, collaborators do. And, and in manipulating that coat to the protein, then it will recognize uh, certain receptors on the surface of some, of some cells, but not on others. So this helps to create a selectivity of targeting of the virus to particular cells. And in our case, what we want is, is to either target rod photoreceptors or cone photoreceptors. So the coat may change depending on which of the cell classes we want to target. Um, and then the delivery method. So there are two ways of doing this. You can use a subretinal injection. And that's good if you uh, want to target photoreceptors because now they're very proximal to the injection uh, volume. Or uh, there, there's the idea of using intravitreal, which is from a, from a therapy pro approach in humans is probably more palatable because it's more easily tolerated. You don't create a retinal detachment uh, at, that has to settle down. And then uh, the promoter is also used to enhance the selectivity of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the gene that's being delivered. So for example, we want to 
uh, target the rod photoreceptors, the rhodopsin promoter is a really good thing to do that. And the, down here is summarizing either subretinal or uh, intravitreal injections. So the retina is a really great place to try uh, approaches, gene therapy approaches. And uh, part of it is because of the transparency of the ocular media. This allows, uh, this allows us to see really well when we're doing both intravitreal and subretinal uh, surgeries like a lot of you do in, in patients. Um, the limited access of the subretinal space and even the eye uh, eliminates uh, systemic side effects, so you know, general systemic inflammatory responses. Um, there's a certain amount of immune privilege that occurs in the intraocular environment, so that also uh, helps with any inflammatory responses that might occur in some gene therapies, you know, for example, those that are targeted at liver. Because it's a bilateral disease, we always have an untreated or a, a control-treated eye as the, as the control for the treated eye, and so that's a nice intra-animal control. And then we can track changes uh, non-invasively with OCT. So here's a, another a fundus image off of our OCT uh, equipment, and here is a, one, of the, um, one, of the, one of the animals uh, OCT where the photoreceptors now here are at the bottom and the ganglion cell layer is here at the top. So we use OCT as well as the ERG as a non-invasive way of tracking what's happening in terms of degeneration and also therapeutic. All right, so what I'd like to do now is to talk about how we're tailoring gene therapy um, to the mutation. So the, what many of you may have read about is, is, the, is the gene therapy for the null mutation in Labor's congenital amaurosis. And this is probably the poster child for gene, ocular gene therapy. And in, in labors, they, you, that you lack a particular uh, uh, the expression of a gene. So what you have is a null mutation. The mutation creates no protein. And so it's a relatively simple uh, disease to treat. Can you replace the absence of this mut mutant protein with a normal protein? And in doing that, can you rescue function? And there's a, and, and the, I think the jury is still out on, on whether that is working perfectly in these, in these patients with labors. Uh, there's, there are some reports of a very good uh, uh, application and of, the, of gene therapy, and there are some reports where uh, the, the, the therapy is not doing as, as good a job. Uh, and that, so as I said, the jury is still out on that. But the idea is, can, the, the idea initially that we had was, can we use gene augmentation um, to try to ameliorate this dominant mutation? So the idea is, can you express more wild-type rhodopsin and therefore reduce the ratio of the wild-type, reduce the mutant to wild-type ratio? And if you do that, can that have a, a therapeutic effect? We started to do that with um, Al Lewin and Bill Houseworth at the University of Florida. But the first thing that we needed to do was a control experiment to ask whether the, uh, the viral vector that we were using was going to give us specific infection of the photoreceptors, the rod photoreceptors themselves. So what we used was a, a green fluorescent protein marker that was driven by the rhodopsin promoter. And here's a, an image, a fluorescence image of the fundus that shows the infection area of, uh, in this particular animal. So the optic nerve head is down here. And so you can see that the area that we get of infection that we get is pretty broad. Uh, it's not the whole eye, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's several disc diameters um, in area. And if you look at the sections of the animals, uh, so the blue is a DAPI stain to show the nuclei of the, of, the, of the various cells in the layers of the retina. And so you can see in the transgenic, we get, some of the, we get very nice uh, infection uh, with, with a, the AAV. And if you look, there's a little row that where, there, where there's no fluorescence in both this animal and this animal, and that represents where the cones are. So the rods are, nice, are, are, are nicely affected. It's probably not every rod, but many of the rods are infected in this, in this uh, application. So we then switched vectors, uh, not, not, uh, not the external coat vector, but now we used 
uh, 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 the same AAV driving rhodopsin in this gene augmentation. And then this is the experimental design. So we inject, we do these subretinal injections at P3 uh, when we know that we have rod, rods around. And then we start to do fundus exams, ERG, and OCT at four weeks and carry it out as long as possible. So this is the, the, the transgenic uh, and wild type data, untreated data that I showed you before. And then we use controls that uh, include the GFP. So sometimes we mix a little GFP in with the, in, in with the therapeutic vector to try to show where the, um, wh where the infected area is. And as I said, we did this work with Al Lewin and a postdoc in my lab, Aaron Rising, and one of our uh, fellows, uh, Nilifor Piri, uh, to do these experiments. So um, unfortunately, we didn't see, rhodopsin augmentation didn't work in our hands uh, in, in this model. So there's no difference between baseline and, and the treated and untreated animals at either four weeks, uh, eight weeks, or 12 weeks uh, in terms of the rod isolated response. So these are these are uh, representative ERGs, and the shaded area is, is, the, uh, is the standard error of the mean of the responses. But we did see an impact on the cones. So these are the summary data from individual animals, and the dashed line is an is a untreated transgenic uh, control. This animal just got the GFP whereas our transgenic animal uh, got the AAV row plus a little GFP, and then the wild type is plotted in black. So what you can see is that um, at, uh, at, at, and this is time across here. So at most of the ages past two weeks, which is what we expect, we expect to see that the transgene will start to be expressed between two and four weeks. And so you can see that it's helping to keep the cone function um, uh, more ro robust uh, in the in, uh, and closer to the wild type than the untreated treated animal, and that also occurred in transgenic animal number three. But in this animal, which did not receive treatment, the uh, the transgenic uh, the, the the two eyes uh, were exactly the same, and these are the individual cone responses uh, from those animals that we've summarized here and here. So. Rhodopsin augmentation is limited in its efficacy. It is safe, but it's, but it's limited in its, its e efficacy. It doesn't help with rod photoreceptor function, and it probably delays the, the decline of cone function, but probably isn't, isn't going to be something that we want to pursue in the future. So the next strategy that I'd like to tell you about with, that's also been done in collaboration with Al Lewin is an idea of knocking down the rhodopsin expression and, and, and reducing it. Now, what we'd really like to do is be able to knock down only the P23H mutant rhodopsin and leave the wild type copies in, in, intact. But the shRNA approach isn't that specific. And so what we are doing is instead knocking down and then using a replacement. So we have an shRNA that's specific for rhodopsin and then a second, uh, a second expression cassette that will express wild type rhodopsin at the same time. And these experiments were really exciting. Um, so shown here are uh, 18, the, the, some, the uh, average of, of the B wave response in 18 wild type animals at P3, in 22 transgenic animals at P3, and in this particular animal, uh, 145-12 at P3 at the time when this animal received the uh, shRNA plus the Rho uh, uh, replacement. Twelve weeks later, the untreated wild type looks again like this. This is the same 18 animals. The untreated transgenics, as I showed you before, have no rod function. But in this particular animal, both the, and, and both eyes received the treatment, uh, we saw a, a, a very significant uh, B wave. So, First thing I thought was we had misgenotyped this animal and that the first P3 recordings weren't any good. And so we regenotyped this animal three times. <laughs> we regenotyped re re the animal at, at, at 12 weeks, which is shown here. We took the animal out to 16 weeks. We saw the same kind of 
uh, B wave uh, 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 response. And then at termination, we also took tissue and regenotyped this animal. And this animal was a transgenic animal every time. So why don't I have a whole litter to show you? This is the most unfortunate litter of animals that we ever had. And, they, and all of its litter mates developed a respiratory infection shortly after they had, they had the treatment and they all died, with the exception of this guy. So I only have this animal to show you for right now, but last week we did a whole litter of 14 with this, this shRNA row. And so hopefully in four weeks we'll be seeing something that's uh, significant and I'll have more to say. This is uh, the OCT from that animal. So here's an untreated transgenic here. You can see that we're losing a lot of the definition in the outer retina, shown down here at the bottom. Here's your untreated wild type animal, which shows all this beautiful definition for what happens in the, in the photoreceptors in the, in the outer, outer part of the retina. And here's this 145-12, which shows some thinning of the ONL, which is what we'd expect because treatment is at P3 and the gene's probably not ramping up until about four, three to four weeks of age, so there's going to be some degeneration in the middle. But at 12 weeks, this animal had a, had a significant outer nuclear layer that was not present in any of the untreated animals that we've seen. And these, anim these, these experiments have been ongoing with uh, Buban Sahu, Gobinda Pangini, and uh, Janelle Adnir, Ad Adiniran, uh, in, who, who, who were just doing these uh, experiments to replicate last week. So we're really excited about this idea of the efficacy of shRNA uh, knockdown with replacement. And then the safety is, is shown here on this slide. So as, as, as expected from everything else I've told you, there's no, uh, the, the, the cone function in, in all these animals, treated and untreated transgenics, is normal at P3, and it remains normal uh, at P12. So the shRNA isn't, with the re replacement, isn't doing any harm to the, to the retinas. So that's also one very important aspect of any gene therapy or any therapy trial. You have to both show efficacy and safety. Okay, so the last thing that I'll tell you about is a neuroprotective strategy. So what was found by um, Jose Sahal and his colleagues uh, uh, was that there is a factor, a, a, a secreted factor that the rods produce that appears to keep the cones healthier and happier, and it's called rod-derived viability factor. And John Flannery and Leah Byrne, who was a postdoc in John's lab, but now is an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh, they had shown in a rodent model that RDCVF could actually delay uh, cone-driven cone uh, uh, cone declines. And so we tried this particular RDCVF in the, in the P23H uh, transgenic animals. And as expected, uh, we don't see a change in rod-driven function. These are animals out at 12 weeks post-injection. Uh, the red is the RDCVF treated eye, and the black is, uh, is the BSS treated eye. And in terms of cone function, we are seeing perhaps a little bit of a, of a, of, of, of a rescue of cone decline uh, in the transgenic versus the BSS treated animals, but these are experiments that are now still ongoing uh, and we're, we're doing a lot of more analyses to convince ourselves of whether this is uh, how, the prevalence of this. So not all animals respond equally and that's going to be the case with, with patients as well. And so we're, so the statistics and the analyses are pretty con involved when you start to come down to trying to compare one individual animal to a, 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 a large number of transgenic animals that are in our database. And so, if anything, what we're seeing, again, is a, is a subtle effect on cone function. And as I said, our analyses here are underway. One last thing that I want to point out about this is that these, we use intravitreal injections and a, and a completely different viral vector uh, for, for these treatments. So, uh, I need to, before I, I close and take questions, I need to acknowledge Hank Kaplan uh, because it was Hank's idea to create this model. 
And I wouldn't be talking to you today, and I wouldn't have this translational component of research in my lab if he had not supported this idea and funded this idea in many ways, ways uh, throughout the last uh, seven to eight years. Um, Doug Emery and Doug Dean are both people that helped with the characterization of the of the animals that I didn't tell you that I told you that I didn't acknowledge previously. And then we've had some very good support from both the NIH and several of the uh, of the foundations that are associated with the University of Louisville, uh, as well as the Foundation for Fighting Blindness and Research to Prevent Blindness. So thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm.